All right, it's time. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Andres Trasavina, and I'm part of the TMS team. I lead our executive recruiting function. And we've been doing this series since November of last year. And every time we do the, the series and have a guest, it's very inspiring. So thank you, Adam, for being here. I'll pass the, the mic to you in a second. But the purpose of the talks is to connect team members with leaders, with experts, with suppliers, with the external folks that can come and talk to us about their life, right? There's no script. There's no topic that is off the table. These are very authentic, transparent conversations. We only ask that you don't share anything that's confidential if we have um, internal uh, work streams going, going on. And throughout the audience, uh, the, the, the session, the audience can ask questions. And I will kick it off to Kate so she can introduce herself and tell you how to ask these questions. Yeah, so my name is Kate. I'm partnering with Andres on the speaker series. And you can uh, feel free to Teams me, put it in the Zoom chat. You can individually chat me on Zoom if you feel, feel comfortable that. And um, just feel free to message anything that is on your mind. All right, so thank you, Kate. Um, Adam, let's just start with what name do you like to be called? Uh, Adam works. Yeah, Adam works. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you can call me Adam. Adam. So tell us about your upbringing. I understand you grew up in Houston. Yeah. So I, I'm either sixth or seventh generation Texan. Um, so I grew up in Houston, uh, part of the Jewish community in Houston. And I actually had a pretty phenomenal childhood. Born in 1982. So I had a, a, a go outside and play childhood, which was fantastic. Um, and my dad, who's actually here, uh, was the coach of my Little League baseball team, basketball team, and the all-time quarterback for the neighborhood football. <laughs> because here's here's the deal. You can't have him just quarterback one team and then, like, Michael Wiesenthal quarterback for the other team. That doesn't work. No. It's got to be even. <laughs> okay. Um, if you were to think about one hobby, one one interest, one hot button, what would that be? Yeah. You know, growing up for me, my, my hobby was art. So I grew up uh, drawing from uh, as early as I could hold a pencil. Uh, and then that became photography and, and cinematography and, and became acting. And so I just think the expression of self um, through nonverbal communication was so wonderful for me it's it's interesting because now i do so much verbal communication <laughs> yeah <laughs> adam tell me about something that you purchased that is that's worth every penny and then some more oh wow uh something that i purchased that's worth every penny and then some um you know it's funny because i'm kind of a minimalist i don't really i don't really uh, own a lot of things that I, I put a lot of value on. I would say uh, my Vitamix, without wow, that, question. That's, that's worth that. every single penny I've ever, yeah, without question. Awesome. <laughs> um, where do you most want to visit in the world and why? Uh, if, to be fair, the place I want to visit is somewhere I've already been, and it is Lakeside in Pocahontas, Nepal. Okay. Uh, so I, I went to Pokhara, Nepal, uh, about a year after I got sober, uh, from substance use disorder. And it was a really interesting time in my life where I was really trying to discover, okay, so I've, I've, and I know we'll talk more about this, but I've recovered from quote unquote, the disorder of my lived experience, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do anymore. And the things that I thought I wanted to do no, no longer held interest. And so I thought, well, how about I just go do something entirely selfless and whatever I noticed that kind of lights me up, maybe that's a way of exploring what do I want to do with my life? And, and you know, I found out that this is actually a principle in, in something called Ikigai, which is a, a Japanese Okinawan principle of discovering your purpose and how what, 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 you, what you can do, what you love to do, and what can create change when you all those three together that's sort of where you should focus your attention but 
I really kind of found myself uh, living at an orphanage. That's what I ended up doing was spending about a year in an orphanage in, in Nepal and living with these kids and being of service to these kids where every single day was more about anyone else, mostly directed towards these uh, kids who are six, ages six to 12 and very little about, you know, myself or self-indulgence, you know, no TV, you know, no video games, n n none of that stuff. Wi-Fi was not very, you, know, you didn't really get a lot and it got no self-service. So I was very much focused on being very selfless. And so I, I kind of rediscovered myself living lakeside and poker. And I feel like my, a good part of myself, an old part of myself was left there mm -hmm. and um, he needed to stay there. Um, and I do want to go back. Awesome. Who's been the most influential person in you in your life and why? Uh, the most influential person in my life um, is uh, my grandmother. Ah. So um, she's, she passed away from an accident and she was my best friend my entire life. And um, I think I've, ne I've never seen anyone with such a, an enjoyment of life and an unbelievable kindness. You know, she, she always told me she would watch people get praised for something and um, they, would, they would feel like they needed to explain why they did what they did. And she, she would always say, you just, just say thank you. Kindness doesn't require uh, uh, definition. You, you don't have to justify an act of kindness. So if you do something kind, you just say thank you. You don't ask for anything in return. And, and so uh, she was the most influential person. Well, I know you somewhat well, Anna, yeah. and I know she had a very good influence on you because you are very kind. Um, thank you for sharing that. So let's talk about food, right? Yeah. We are a whole food market. Yeah. That's what we do. Let's keep it simple. If you had to eat the same meal for the rest of your life, what would that be? It's pretty much what I do already. Um, so I, I eat a plant-exclusive diet. I also identify as a vegan. Um, but I don't like to say that I eat a vegan diet because I don't think veganism is a diet. Um, but I eat a plant exclusive diet. And I think my favorite thing to eat uh, is oatmeal without question. And you can do it sweet. You can do it savory. Mm -hmm. It is the most versatile. It's travel ready, right? It can be, I, I mean, you give me a bag of oats and leave me somewhere and I'll be fine. I would be fine. And I'll enjoy the hell out of it. So <laughs> really, good. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have oats. For the yeah. next time. Great. <laughs> All right. So that was warm up. Yeah. That was warm up. And the this the series are called How How Adversity Has Brought Opportunities yeah. to People's Lives. So we've had different stories, but with you, I would love for you to share your story when you hit rock bottom. Yeah. Take me back to that place and what was your journey to overcome all of that. Yeah. Um, so I, like I said, I grew up in Texas and I grew up Jewish. So I was, I was born into a diet of burgers and barbecue and bagels and blintzes. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is not, neither of those cultures really centered their focus of diet around anything that we considered health. Right. It was more about celebration and celebration can be healthy, but a lot of times it's indulgence. Um, and I grew up slightly overweight as a kid. And I think I grew up with the same kind of viewpoint that a lot of people did uh, of my generation was that the, the environment that we found ourselves in, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, was a pretty toxic food environment, still is. But it, it, it encouraged a lot of uh, decisions that were likely to lead you towards gaining weight. And I did. And it seemed that no matter what I did, no matter how hard I tried, and no matter how much movement I, or exercise I engaged in, no matter how much restriction I engaged in, I couldn't outcompete this adversary that was my body. I was in full belief that my body was an adversary. And no matter how hard I tried, I was never going to outcompete out this body. And so I gave up. I gave up until I was in high school. In high school, I had moved from Houston to Austin. I didn't know anyone. I was an awkward freshman. And so I got bullied quite a lot my freshman year. Um, 
to to the point where where I would park my car or where I get dropped off had to be at a specific spot so that the school could have eyes on me because I would get rocks thrown at me. And so my body wasn't a safe place to be. My school wasn't a safe place to be. And that's where I spent the majority of my time. The majority of my time was within myself and at school. So the majority of the time I felt very afraid and very unsafe. And I had been diagnosed with ADHD and I got prescribed a medication called Adderall. And Adderall is a stimulant form of medication used to treat ADHD. And I remember taking my prescription during class one day. And someone saw me taking it. And as I walked out of the classroom, I would have to take specific routes because certain kids had their lockers in certain areas of the school. And I just didn't want to deal with it. And one of those kids who I typically would avoid at all costs, as we're walking out, I find his arm around. And he's like, hey, just so you know, man, like we got this party this weekend and, you know, we really wanted to invite you. Here I am waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting to get thrown into the lockers or, you know, done something, have something done to me. And um, he says, you know, just, you know, I saw you were taking some out. I'll just bring that with you. And, you know, look, here's the thing. I was in no way. Uh, uh, missing what was happening there. I, I knew what was going on. They, they didn't care if I came. They, they wanted me to bring Adderall to this party, which at the time I actually didn't know was a recreational drug. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was so excited because what I had found wasn't a way to go to the party. What I had found was a way to be safe. I found a way to solve a very painful problem in my life, which was how do I feel safe in school? And um, I remember going to the party. Of course, I wanted to go. Of course, I wanted to bring Adderall because, as I mentioned, this was a way to finally feel safe around these kids. But I used it as a recreational drug for the first time. And it was like, boom. I mean, I was immediately hooked. And I wasn't hooked to the substance. This is really important. I was hooked to what it did for me because I was slightly overweight as a freshman. Uh, I was, I had no confidence because I didn't know anyone. We had moved from Houston to Austin. Um, I was struggling with my ability as a student. And as a result of that, I was struggling with my relationship with my father and my mother at home. And all of a sudden I got this immediate recognition that I was going to be able to solve all of those problems because Adderall, as I mentioned, is an amphetamine. That's what the stuff is. And I'm not anti-Adderall. I'm not anti-medicine at all. I'm just saying this to clarify what it does and why, why it did what it did for me. So when you're on amphetamines, you typically have an increased metabolism, which lowers your hunger drive and increases your energy. Mm -hmm. So now not only did I not want to eat, uh, I was able to burn more calories per second than I was before. And that's an incredibly attractive thing to someone who's never been able to solve their weight problem. Um, I had unbelievable confidence delivered with unbelievable ease and unbelievable repeatability. That's attractive to someone who's nervous and feels alone. Um, I found a way to be valued within a group of people that had been harming me. That's attractive. And all I had to do was have Adderall. Okay. So ease and repeatability of being able to be safe. That's really attractive to someone who spent the majority of their time feeling afraid. And it also allowed me to hyper-focus on work. So I could not only appear to have the ability to study. I actually could now for the first time and with ease and repeatability. That is incredibly attractive. All of the problems in my life that had made life hard and were seemingly going to continue to be difficult had been solved with unbelievable ease and unbelievable repeatability. And so what that meant for me was my future, which seemed like a scary place to be, tomorrow always seemed terrifying. So all of a sudden it wasn't so terrifying. It actually looked like an exciting place to be, an enjoyable place to be, something I was looking forward to. That is a very powerful thing to deliver to someone who's experiencing depression and anxiety. And that's what I was hooked to. And it worked. Uh, I made friends. Um, I lost the weight. I had girlfriends. I had an unbelievable time in high school. And my, my schoolwork got better, which as a result, I'm not saying my relationship was bad with my fa family because I was a poor student. There was tension in our relationship because I was a poor student. And so that was resolved. 
And so it seemed to magically be able to make me the person I thought I was always needing to be, but couldn't figure out how to be with unbelievable ease and unbelievable repeatability. And I got a scholarship to the college that I wanted to go to. I was super excited. And after about the first, my freshman year of school, I started to experience what you typically experience within substance use is that more started to not be enough. And then not enough became an overwhelming problem in my life because instead of the normal loving and meaningful and exciting bonds in my life that I would be focused on myself, my friends, my purpose, what was going on in the world around me, those meaningful, important things started to sever. And the only thing I could focus on was how much do I have left? How much will it cost? Where will I get more? How much, you know, uh, what am I going to have to do to pay for it? And so by the time I was a sophomore, halfway through my sophomore year of school, I just decided to drop out. And I told my parents that I was going to drop out because I wanted to take a year off and study, or I'm sorry, work in the field that I was studying, which to be fair, I did get a job. But that is not why I decided to drop out. I wanted to go back to Austin. I was in school in Georgia. I wanted to go back to Austin because I knew the people that I could buy drugs from and I knew the doctors that I could scam. And that is exactly what I started doing. I was doctor shopping, which is having multiple doctors prescribe the same medications without them knowing about it. It's a felony. I was buying and selling drugs on the street and I was treating my family like absolute garbage. The only time I would ever see my parents was to get mad at them and blame them and shame them for everything that was wrong in my life, or so that I could get money from them so that I could buy drugs for me. And I would do anything to anybody in order for me to get what I needed. I mean, it didn't matter how close you were to me. It didn't matter if I just met you. If, if, if you were a way for me to get what I needed, I was going to do it to you. And it didn't, didn't matter what I needed to do. And I became incredibly depressed incredibly isolated. For the first time, that incredible solution that I had found started to feel like an overwhelming problem. And the belief in that moment was, well, I'm going to figure this out because you don't know how good it felt in the beginning. You don't know what incredible solution had been delivered and it must continue to be a solution. So I'm just going to figure, if I could just get more, I'll figure this thing out. And I started to go two, three weeks without drugs because I would go through it so quickly. And I needed something that would allow me to not be present. And I found fast food. I mean, fast food, again, delivered with ease and repeatability, the opportunity to just numb myself up from life. And after about five or six years of intense substance use, I was 350 pounds. Um, I had a bunch of chronic disease disorders that I didn't know were occurring. But I did know that I had a sense, obviously, that things were going the wrong way. But again, It had to be something or someone else's fault. And when I tell you that I was struggling with with food, what I would tell you is every single day I would get up and I'd go to Torchy's Tacos and I would get three or four potato, egg and cheese breakfast tacos, then immediately go to McDonald's, get two supersized double quarter pounder meals, then Whataburger, get the extra large honey barbecue chicken strip sandwich meal for dinner, an extra large pizza from Papa John's with sausage on top, side of chicken strips with a honey mustard dipping sauce. Then at about three in the morning, go back to Whataburger for three of the breakfast on a bun sandwiches with sausage. And I would drink about 20 sodas a day. When I tell people that I was struggling with substance use disorder or addiction, the average prescription for Adderall is about 10 milligrams for every 24 hours. I was doing 450 milligrams every 24 hours. And there were days when I would do upwards of a thousand. And I would do this for about six days straight. I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't sleep. Um, I would uh, start to become uh, very paranoid, beginning stages of a drug-induced psychosis. I would uh, develop obsessive compulsive tics, one of which was I couldn't stand to feel the hair touch my ears. And I remember one night, I was up all night. I, I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. But I do know that I was brushing my hair forward and back all night long so hard because I couldn't feel, I didn't want to feel that that hair touching my ears. And when I went into the bathroom the next morning, just to go to the bathroom, I had brushed all the hair completely off the side of my head. And it was at about this really, really miserable time in my life. Um, And I I had no job. I had, I had friends I wouldn't allow into my life. And I had family that I wouldn't allow into my life. Um, My dad, who's here, came to me and he offered me an opportunity. He offered me the opportunity to go to an event actually hosted by 
whole foods market. In 2010, they had started doing these total health immersion programs with, uh, and one of them was with a man named Rip Esselstyn, who is the founder of Plant Strong, executive producer of the film, The Game Changers, and he and his dad are the focus of the film called Forks Over Knives. And look, I didn't want to go. I had no interest in going. But I knew that if I could convince my dad that I was taking this thing seriously, I could say, well, look, you know, this is going to be really hard. So what I need you to do is to support me going through this, right? How do I get more money? That's what I was thinking. And in fact, I had to go to the Whole Foods headquarters and meet with Rip Esselstyn because it was only available to Whole Foods market employees. And there was a few spots open. And I had to convince him to give me a spot. And so I did what every addict is really good at doing. I just lied. I put on a show. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't know who he was. I didn't want to know who he was. I didn't know what a plant-based diet was. And I sure as shit didn't want to know what a plant-based diet was. I just needed him to say yes so that I could convince my family to give me money so that I could buy more drugs. And he did say yes. And I, I went and I was high the whole time. And I'm not saying this to sound cool or to make a joke. Um, I was high the whole time. Uh, I brought drugs with me. Uh, in fact, at the time, I had started to live like a hoarder. Um, I barely uh, showered for months at a time. I wouldn't brush my teeth. Um, and I was very diaphoretic. What I mean by that is my face was always very flushed red. And I would sweat through about two, three shirts a day. And I smelled very toxic. And in my my presence and appearance was so disruptive to the staff at the retreat that they almost asked me to leave. Um, and I know that the reason why I wasn't asked to leave is because Rip is, who is now a very dear friend of mine, uh, he always sees the good in people. And what he didn't want to do is ask someone who desperately needed his help to leave. And I, I went to every lecture, I listened to everything that was said, mm -hmm. and it all made sense. They talked about using plant-based nutrition as a way to recapture your health. Great, wonderful. What I heard was an opportunity to recapture the experience of feeling fully alive. And, you know, I was motivated. I was inspired for sure. And I wish I could tell you that after seven days of that retreat, listening to luminary thought leaders like Rip Esselstyn, Jeff Novick, and Doug Lyle, and luminary doctors like Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Michael Clapper, that that was all that I needed to do in order to change my life. That I listened, I heard, I said, yep, great, fantastic, let's go. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna do this deal. But here's the thing, I was not willing to let go of what was allowing me to escape a life that was just too painful a place to be. On the gamble that this plant-based diet thing would work out in a year, that's a terrifying thing. And so my life got much worse as a result of leaving. And this is, I think this is valuable because if all we needed to do was have intellect and will, right, knowledge and will, knowing what to do and wanting to do it, well, then everybody would change their life. But by 2012, my life had become the worst than it had ever been. And I had been battling suicidal thoughts for six months. Um, and the reason for that is, it's not that you know, my health had gotten so much worse in those two years. It was pretty bad that day. But every day had become the most painful day of my life, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And I lived in full confidence that tomorrow was going to be even worse. And when you live like that long enough, tomorrow is just eventually not something that you want to be a part of. And I didn't have a plan. I didn't write a note. But on August 21st of 2012, uh, I tried to end my life. Um, I was 30 years old. I already had erectile dysfunction for reasons I didn't understand. Um, I had all these infections on my leg from scratching mosquito bites that wouldn't heal for reasons I didn't understand. I had stretch marks and sores and bed sores, and I would routinely self-harm by looking myself in the mirror and hitting myself as hard as I could, hoping that if I could just hate myself enough and hate my life enough that I would actually want to do something about it. And that just made me feel like there was no hope. And I grabbed a handful of pills. I threw them down my throat. And I've been battling suicide, uh, battling substance use now for 10 years. So uh, overdose was not something I was, you know, was, it wasn't new to me. I had, I had 
several experiences where I nearly overdosed, but this was distinctly different. And I remember trying to stand up off of my couch and my entire right side cramped. And it felt like I got stabbed in the right side of my body with a hot knife. And I buckled over and black starts to fade in from my periphery. And I have this recognition that I'm about to spend the last second of my life. Um, and I'm completely separate from everyone and everything that's ever meant anything to me. And that was what was painful about it. Not the physical description I just laid out for you, but the realization that the reason I was separate wasn't because they didn't want to be there for me. It was because I made it impossible for them to. And I woke up on the floor of my apartment a few hours later in a puddle of vomit and a pile of fast food garbage. And after I had spent enough time coming to and realizing what happened, I was overwhelmed with this immense feeling of relief. And that was really interesting to me because for that relief to happen, there must be something about myself and my life that I loved enough. There had to be something about myself and my life that was meaningful enough that even though I knew today was going to be the hardest day of my life, I still wanted to be part of it. I still wanted to show up. And so what that told me was that, you know, for the majority of people, I will say this with 100% certainty, suicide is not someone wanting to end their life. It's someone wanting to end their pain. Mm. It's someone wanting to end the pain that they don't understand. They don't know how it got there. They don't know that it's okay that they don't know how it got there. And they don't know that it's okay to ask for help because it's typically wrapped in some kind of shame. And if you had known me back then, I was that guy. And I think we've all met this person. That if it's a friend of yours and you love them or it's a family member and you love them, you would have come up to me and you would have said, hey, Adam, what are you doing? Don't you see what you're doing to yourself? Don't you see what you're doing to your life? Don't you see what you're doing to your family? Why won't you stop? And if you'd said that to me, I'd look at you right in the eye and say, you know, F you. You don't know how much my life hurts. You don't know how much it hurts every single minute. And so you can't understand how much relief I get. When I use. So are you going to offer me a solution to never use again right now? Because if you're not, this is how I have to live my life. And if it costs me five years, if it costs me 10 years, fine. This is how I have to do it. And I think about that now and I understand why I would have thought like that. But I think about it now. If I had been successful on August 21st of 2012, what would my family not give? Mm -hmm for 10 more years of me, 10 years. I threw that number out there like it cost nothing. 10 years. What would my family not give for 10 more days, right? I mean, just think about someone in your life who has meant the world to you, who's no longer here. What would you not give for five more hours with that person? You know, the things that we choose to believe have consequences not just on us, but on the people that we care about. And so I took an opportunity and I called my dad and I asked for help. And without judgment, without question, there was none of that. Well, we have been trying to get you to, to do this for years. I don't know why it's taken so long or none of the I told you so's. Just, you know, Adam, we don't know what to do, but why don't you come over and let, let us help you figure this out. And what they actually said to me was, we love you whether you're using or you're not. We love you, whatever state you're in. So please come sit with us because all we want to do is help. That is really valuable to someone who's struggling, especially someone who's struggling with substance use or mental health issues, is to be reminded that they matter to those who matter the most to them. And that not only are they hoping that they get better, they're hoping they get better because they want them around. They're holding a place for them. They've been waiting for them. So I checked into rehab about two weeks later. And within 72 hours, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, erectile dysfunction, which I knew about, um, and a whole host of psychological conditions from chronic, uh, from um, clinical de suicidal depression, anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, chemically induced bipolar disorder. And they put me on a cabinet's worth of medication for life. And I was shocked because I was an absolute cliche. Like I used 
before I left my house after overdosing because I couldn't do life without her. And so my plan was to do 28 days in rehab, get a vacation separate from my substance, recalibrate, get a handle on me, and then I'll go back and I'll use, but, you know, responsibly. And I know it's, 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 it's absurd, but that's the thought was, I'm going to figure out a way that I can do this and not let go of this behavior. But thankfully I was incredibly sick and I'm so grateful because what it told me was if I wasn't willing to change the, every single way in which I moved through the world, yeah, I might be sober. Sure. But if all I tried to do was not use, it wasn't going to allow me to have a life where I felt fully alive that felt meaningful. And it certainly didn't promise me anything longer than five or 10 years. And I, I walked out of the doctor's office and I was ready to quit and leave. And so I called my dad and, you know, he could hear how afraid I was, how scared I was, how confused I was. And he, you know, I told him, I said, look, I'm out of here, I'm leaving. Like I, all I thought I had to do was get off of drugs. I came here to stop using drugs and, and, and feel better. I, I am. Now I find out I have diabetes and heart disease and, and all these other conditions I don't understand. I can't do this. I'm done. Right. What he heard was I'm afraid and I don't know what to do. And so what I want to do is avoid the situation. And, you know, my dad and I, as a, when I was growing up, my dad and I had a really interesting relationship where he's been like my superhero. He's also been a, quite an adversary to me. Um, but on that phone call, he calmed me down. And he explained to me, he said, Adam, you know, look, I don't know if you have heart disease or diabetes, but let's just say that you do. Maybe you don't. Let's just say that you do. When you went to that retreat two years ago, remember, you learned that these are reversible conditions and that you know exactly what to do to reverse these conditions. So if there's something about your life that's hard and it's painful and you can change it, it's not a problem. Also, when it comes to these other psychological conditions, I don't know what these things are either. And if there's something about your life that's hard and it's difficult and you can't do anything about it, it is, it's also not a problem. It's just the way things are. And so what if we work for the next 28 days with your care team and your mother and I, and we help you see these other things as, you know, not so difficult. Look at them in a different way so that it's not so hard on you. In that moment, my dad, who I had always seen as like the, the picture of perfection, he, he completely said, I don't know what to do. And he became my teammate. Mm -hmm. He became my ally. And I just decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to start to build the backbone of my recovery around reversing my disease. And that's what I was going to focus on. Not how do I not use, but how do I intentionally design and organize a life so that every single day I become a healthier version of myself. And they weren't allowed about to let me change my diet and rehab, but I moved into sober living about 37 days labor, later. And I would spend 10 months in sober living, but I didn't know that at the time. I, I, was, I didn't even want to go. But thankfully, my, my, my parents, being amazing as they are, and knowing me, said, well, if you think you can do this on your own, good luck. Or you want to go into sober living, we'll support you. And Thankfully, I was so willing to be so honest with myself and not so arrogant with myself. And I recognized I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do it on my own. So I go into, into sober living facility in Santa Monica. And in the sober living facility, you're allowed to decide what you want to eat. Just write out a list and you give it to the house manager. So I walked up to the house manager whose last name is actually Hamburger. And I told him <laughs> that I wanted to start this plant strong lifestyle. I said, I don't know what a plant strong lifestyle is. I said, I really don't either. But I went to this retreat and I remember some of the things they ate. So I wrote you this list. It was about that long because the only greens I really ever ate before that was the piece of lettuce they didn't take off my burger at McDonald's. <laughs> and I wrote this list. It had oatmeal, black beans, brown rice, frozen veggies, and fruit. And the reason I wrote that is because I, I sat down and I tried to write a meal plan. And I just trying to rack my brain to remember all the meals that they served. And all I could remember was... Gosh, every day there was rice and beans. Every day there was oatmeal. Every day there was fruit and veggies. So, okay, here you go. And I remember waking up the next day and I go to the 
cabinet and they put the oatmeal next to Fruity Pebbles. And for those of you who are watching and those of you who are here, Fruity Pebbles is the best cereal ever made. And I'm not here to argue with you because you're wrong if you think differently. <laughs> it's the best cereal ever made. And they put it next to the oatmeal, which I asked for. And I literally started crying, started getting angry. I threw a towel at someone, which is really weird. Yeah. I ran out of the house and I started storming down Venice Boardwalk. And I was like, I don't know what I was planning to do. But the house, another house manager ran after me. His name is Luke Chittick. And he grabbed a hold of me. And he's, I don't know, this dude, what is going on? It's like, man. I, I got all this stuff going on. I'm trying to get sober. I'm trying to go to my meetings. And like, all I wanted was the meal to be easy. And they got, yes, I'm this junk food in the house. I'm an adult. I shouldn't have to deal with this. And he looks at me and he goes, Adam, if you're such an adult, why can't you deal with it? And of course, my immediate response is to get really angry because, man, did he put a spotlight on truth there. <laughs> And I just like, I grunted at him and like walked back in. And I had remembered that there was a talk at the retreat that I went to by a guy named Doug Lyle. He's an evolutionary psychologist. And he gave us a talk. It's actually a TED talk so people can watch it. It's called The Pleasure Trap. What The Pleasure Trap describes is that there is an internal mechanism, a biological response that we get from behaviors that give us a signal as to what behaviors are statistically likely to increase our probability of survival. And so when we eat food, or food and sex are the main things that, that give us the biological drive for, for biological success. When we eat food, we get a dopamine lift, right? A lift in our dopamine circuitry. And I, I know dopamine has become a buzzword in, in mental health and in, and in food. We shouldn't do anything that triggers dopamine. Oh, good luck. What dopamine is, is it's a guidance system. And if we were to travel back in time 30,000 years, we'd see that guidance system work really well because we'd find ourselves in an environment of scarcity, competition, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and expense, meaning that in order to find food, it would cost us a lot of energy to go out and find it. It was really competitive, meaning that we weren't the only ones looking for that food, right? And it was dangerous. We weren't the only ones who were looking for it, and some of those other things might be harmful to us, and getting there might be harmful to us. So scarce, competitive, and dangerous. We have to be efficient. We have to be able to identify which foods in the environment give us the most calories per bite because we don't have a lot of time. And we might need to bring back food for other people. And so the more calories per bite in food, the greater the lift in the dopamine circuitry. The greater the lift in the dopamine circuitry, the greater the signal that says you've just done something really successful. This is exactly what you need to do. You need to do this and you need to repeat it. And if we were to travel from 30,000 years to today, within the last 50 years, we'd see an incredible shift in the caloric environment where now there's foods with more calories per bite than have ever existed in human history. And the cost of time and energy to repeat that behavior is lower than it's ever been, right? So this is incredibly attractive to our motivational system that we are compelled to repeat behaviors that give us a high dopamine response because to us, it's an indication of biological success. So what that told me was when I was standing there looking at fruity pebbles and oatmeal, the reason why it felt so difficult to choose the right choice, the healthy choice, wasn't because I was weak. It wasn't because I didn't have a sense of moral fiber or a, in discipline. It was because that is exactly the way that my biology and psychology should respond, be responding to foods that look that attractive. This is exactly what should be happening. There's nothing wrong with you. And then if I was willing to make the right choice long enough, my dopamine receptors would regain sensitivity. And essentially, it wouldn't be a hard, a hard choice. And then a little bit longer, if I was just a little bit longer, I would actually start to be attracted to the oatmeal. And if I just go a little bit longer than that, it would be very difficult for me not to want to choose the oats. I had to be willing to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's really what that lecture told me. And the reason why I was willing to do this, this is very interesting. I like to, to, to talk about this when people say, find your why. If you were to look at me then, you go, oh, well, that's obvious. He's 350 pounds. He has type 2 diabetes. He has heart disease, nearly died from substance use disorder. That's why he's doing that. How could it not be that? It's 100% true. I was struggling with all those things, but my motivation was far from those. Human beings are not motivated by negative consequences. We're motivated to protect what those negative consequences can take from us. That's why it's important. That's why we notice these things. The loving and meaningful bonds in your life that are being threatened that's why it matters that you change. That's why it matters if you learn to do something new or if you learn to do something you already do better. 
So the reason why I was willing to do it wasn't because I was sick. It's because the diseases I had could cost me the ability to be present with the loving and meaningful bonds in my life that give me the experience of being fully alive. And when you align yourself with those loving and meaningful bonds, you're not focused on what not to do. You're very clearly focused on what you want to do. What I wanted to do was to be able to show up and be present for myself, both physically and emotionally, in a healthy and loving way every single day. I wanted to have a loving and meaningful bond with people in my life that I could show up and be present for every single day. I wanted to have a loving and meaningful bond with a purpose beyond myself that I could share within a community of shared respect that I want to show up and be present for every single day. And I wanted to have a future that felt safe, exciting, and a place that I wanted to be, that I wanted to get up and work for every single day. In order to do that, I don't have to avoid meat, eggs, and dairy. What I needed to do was know exactly which choices to make. And it looked very much like a plant-predominant or plant-exclusive diet. And I saw it also as an act of self-care and self-love and of recovery. It's an affirmation of recovery. It was a way of saying to myself three, four, five times a day, that no matter how hard your day is, right, that I'm still capable, still have faculty of change still have the ability to influence my future no matter how hard things seem, that this is something that I could do every single day so that tomorrow is less difficult. Tomorrow feels a little bit better. Tomorrow feels a little bit safe. That's really powerful. It helped me feel really safe. And after about four months, my diabetes, heart disease, and erectile dysfunction were completely reversed. Four months, is that? Four months. Wow. Within 10 months, uh, I had lost over 100 pounds. And within one year, I was off of every single medication I was put on rehab, the antidepressants, the mood stabilizers, the sleeping medications, everything. I've lost 180 pounds as of today. I'm 10 years sober. Um, really, what I noticed was that food for me wasn't the only solution. Of course not. I was doing incredible work in therapy. I was, uh, I was supported by incredible people. Um, and I had a place to come home to that wanted me. Um, but what a vehicle it was to give me the ability to reconnect to a life that felt safe and that felt easy enough to do the things I wanted to do where I could get up every single day. My body was, was looking forward to it. You know, I'd spent 10 years waking up every single day and in survival mode where I could just find any toxic substance, food or drugs to allow me to, to numb myself up and, ex and escape the experience of being alive. And survival mode is hard. It's a hard deal. Um, but what, what I learned from Rip and what I've been able to uh, grab a hold of, uh, the reason why I'm so passionately connected and bonded with, with, um, with plant-based nutrition is because it offered me the ability to start living my day instead of surviving it. And that's really important. When I say that I had a bond with uh, plant-based nutrition, I don't look at addiction as simply uh, a, a process of chemical hooks, creating a sense that after a while, you, you do it long enough and you just won't, won't be able to stop. That, that's very myopic and, and it doesn't serve anybody. Yes, chemical hooks are real. Sure they are, but that's not why people gravitate towards, towards substance use. Every single substance on the planet that is considered a drug has that chemical hook, whether it's heroin, cocaine, you know, marijuana, whatever it is, whether it's sex or gambling. So why is someone addicted to one and not the other? The reason why is because when someone is in a state of living, where their life isn't somewhere that they want to be a part of. They don't feel like they have a place in their community that they can feel safe and their future isn't somewhere that they want to be a part of. And they use a substance. One of those substances is going to relieve their pain in an unbelievable way. It's going to give them a sense that of caring for their pain. It's what it feels like. And it's an easy way to solve something that nothing else in their life seems to be able to solve. And so they bond with it. They, create a loving and meaningful relationship with a behavior that seems to offer them a sense of safety. That's what's happening. And so the same process occurred for me with nutrition and movement. I created a bonding experience where I, I have a true loving and meaningful bond with how I choose food and how I choose movement and how I choose to show up every single day. And so I've become very passionate about that. And I think food is at the heart of, of everything that we do in life. It's how we live. It's how we celebrate. It's how we mourn. Right? It's how we, you know, it, it's how we come together and have conversation. So when people say food is fuel, like you see that in the fitness industry, stop that. Food is not fuel. Food is everything that we make important in life. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that we, that it's bad. It, you know, celebrating food is a wonderful thing. And so uh, I've become very 
very uh, passionate about studying the impact that food has on the ability of one's, one's ability to recover from difficult situations. We have a uh, few wow. Wow. questions. Wow, so many comments yeah. too on the chat. Like yeah. people relating, congratulations, <laughs> exceptional, love, wow. Thank you. you. You had a question. Yeah, everyone just saying that's very inspirational and they uh, really enjoyed hearing about your journey. So thank you. Yeah. And um, one of the questions was, what are some tips for people new to plant-based diets yeah. and kind of like how to get introduced to that lifestyle? Yeah, this is a really good question. First and foremost, I'll tell people, don't define yourself by your diet, right? Don't say, don't say you're eating a, a, a vegan diet unless the vegan ethics relate to you. Um, I don't think people should go vegan for their health. I think that they should make decisions for their health. Um, and decisions uh, when, or in regards to the vegan lifestyle aren't always healthy. Um, they're sometimes great. I love Nottamu, but I wouldn't tell someone to eat Nottamu for health. Um, what they should do is they should focus on fiber. What you want to do is you want to increase your fiber intake. So I, my, my nonprofit ran a research study just recently. It was the very first controlled trial to investigate the effects of nutrition on early addiction recovery outcomes. And what we discovered is that after 10 weeks, uh, the control diet, which is the diet that was served at the treatment facility, which is somewhat elevated Western diet, is actually not a very poorly designed dietary pattern, um, was compared to the treatment diet, which was a whole food plant-based diet, uh, a very uh, high quality dietary pattern. What we discovered is after 10 weeks, individuals with the highest dietary quality, and the dietary quality separator was fiber intake. Uh, ones with the highest dietary quality had statistically significant differences in self-esteem and resilience mm. compared to those with the lowest dietary quality. And the difference between the lowest performing group and the highest performing group was a 5x difference in fiber intake. Do not focus on going plant-based or going paleo or whatever. Try to get 50 grams of fiber per day. Watch how much more plants you have to eat in order to do that. You're likely to drastically improve the quality of your dietary patterns simply by focusing on fiber alone. And if you notice, hey, you know what? I'm actually feeling a lot better. Uh, I notice that like I have more energy. I sleep better. Um, I'm still getting some of my protein from animal products. I think what I'll do is I'm going to make some strategic replacements here. I might now start adding a little bit more tempeh or a little bit more tofu or a little more and more lentils and just slowly start replacing and see how I feel. What you want to be doing is what I like to say is running experiments. Yeah. I tell people that my entire journey through uh, recovery was a series of seven day experiments because I didn't give myself any ultimatum that I had to do this for the rest of my life. What I wanted to do was discover what was accurate in its ability to increase my ability to live life the way I wanted to. So that's what you're looking for. You're trying to find out what's an accurate way to improve the quality of my dietary pattern. Don't worry about labeling it. That's, mm -hmm. that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't serve you. What you're trying to do is you're trying to find accurate ways to increase your ability to feel alive. Start with fiber and you'll do better. Yeah. Adam, so... Your story obviously went to rock bottom. Yeah. And, but I think all of us can relate in, in some ways. And I'll, I'll share a story with, with, with you and with you all. When you did the talk at Tribal yeah. and you went and you and your dad hugged, that moment to me brought the, the awareness of what I was not doing to cultivate a relationship with my own dad. Similarly, actually, my dad, my superhero, but very great. Yeah, very credit. And since then, we started to have a, a better relationship, which is, as a byproduct of that, you work on the things that yeah. you want to work on. So uh, thank you for that moment. Oh, but God. everyone here has, I mean, someone shared that she's dealing with something similar with her daughter. But relating to you and the openness that you have to share your story, it, it's so inspirational. Thank you. And look, we are dealing with difficult moments like there's COVID and there's inflation and there yeah. is like hate in the world. But, but if you are close to, to your loved ones, if you are passionate about living yeah. and not just surviving, we can overcome just about everything. You hit it on the head because what we're looking at is we're seeing increased rates in depression and anxiety mm -hmm. globally right now. And of course, the story would be, oh, we're seeing increases in the disease of depression, disease of anxiety. Well, hang on a second. Let's, let's humanize this experience really quickly. What we've seen happen over the last two years is the world becoming a, a, an increasingly more dangerous place to be. 
So your life is now a lot more difficult and dangerous than it used to be. And it seems like the future might also be a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more unsafe than it used to be. So depression and anxiety should be the most reasonable response your psychology should have to the way that the world looks right now. So you're, you're, if you're experiencing more depression, if you're experiencing more anxiety, it's not because there's something wrong with you. That is a very human and reasonable response to the world as it is right now. And so when I, when I say this, because I'm not telling people that they shouldn't take their depression and anxiety seriously, of course you should, but you shouldn't consider yourself broken yeah. for feeling those things. In the same way we look at addiction, we look at addiction in a very obvious and kind of reasonable way. What someone who views someone who's suffering from addiction or substance use disorder, what they'll do is they'll make a very reasonable question to them. They want to know why won't this person stop? Why won't you stop using? That's a very reasonable question to ask as someone from the outside looking in. The much more valuable question to ask is, why would their use make sense? Why to them does using seem so valuable? Answering that question gives us a much more valuable opportunity to help this individual reorganize their life, their priorities, and their values. Not so that they never use again, but so their use becomes a lot less necessary. And if it does happen, it's seldom, it might be convivial, it might be celebratory, but it's not as disorders, uh, disordered as it once was. They're not, they're, the reason why they can't stop using isn't because they used. The reason they used and the reason why they continue to use is because for them, they were presented an opportunity to solve some kind of pain they haven't been able to solve before with unbelievable ease and unbelievable repeatability. So to them, it's incredibly attractive. Mm -hmm. So they bonded with it. So that's, I think that we have uh, amazing changes that are happening in the field of mental health right now. And I hope that we're going in that direction instead of saying, oh, you have a problem. Let's, let's stop you from doing that problem. Instead yeah. of asking why does it make sense that you have this problem? It makes, it makes me, it makes us feel fortunate to be in a place, in an environment where we're around food. Yeah. We're around people yes. that love food. And we are around people that are... Um, like-minded right so come to the office and feel this energy yeah. please yeah uh, just to take us home adam so talk talk to us a little bit about the the role that exercise plays in your life yeah. and what's ahead for you in the yeah. next year i know your beautiful fiance is here yes. like what what gets you excited and best place to eat in austin plant-based where where is this community yeah so Nothing is more exciting in my life than, than my fiance Laura right now. Um, okay. uh, but the role that exercise has played for me, I got inspired to start running by a man named Rich Roll. Uh, Rich Roll is an ultra endurance athlete. He wrote a book called Finding Ultra. Um, and in his book, he talks about being an overweight alcoholic um, who was broke. And uh, on the eve of his 40th birthday, he couldn't get up the stairs. He got winded and, you know, he, he had this horrible situation where his life was going to go one direction, which was down. And what he decided to do was he, he had a beautiful rock bottom moment. Everyone's rock bottom is different. Um, was he decided, hey, here's what I need to do. I need to seek out recovery. I need to change the way that I eat. I need to change the way, to, way that I move. What happened as a result of that, by 2004, or sorry, uh, I think it was 2004, 2006, he was listed as one of the fittest humans on the planet. Uh, he placed second place in something called the, um, uh, the I can't remember the name of the race, but it's, it's a big five race where they do an Ironman on each one of the Hawaiian islands in five consecutive days. Um, and he placed second or third in that. And he wrote this book. It's a remarkable book about the power of plant-based nutrition, the power of recovery. And I was really inspired. I never considered myself a runner. My dad had always enjoyed running and so i was always around running i said whatever let me just let me see how this feels what i discovered was that running for me was an amazing opportunity to find meditation mm -hmm. um i noticed that when i was running i was able to find those moments when the only thing that existed was my pace my step and my breath uh five minutes didn't exist five minutes from now didn't exist five minutes before didn't exist five days five before, after all of it, was, I was just right here. I was very connected to my body and I found this to be very freeing. So I started using running as another tool for recovery. And I ended up doing a lot of running. Um, and then I kind of got done with it. I, I kind of feel like I got a little burned out by it. And so I started to go in another direction of exploration. When I started running, I told myself that I would, I don't think I could ever run a 10K, right? 
don't think I can do it. Let's just see how far I can run. And I've actually run quite a significant distance further than that. What happened was I got to scratch something off of my bullshit list. It was a bullshit lie I've been telling myself because somewhere along the story of my life, someone got me to believe that I wasn't capable of doing great things. And I got to take that off the list. Running allowed me to do that. Mm-hmm. And so once that one of those things gets taken off the list, you know, I have to consider everything else you've ever put on that list is also being bullshit, right? If you just because you think you can't or someone told you you can't or you've told yourself you can't do it, that's not evidence that you can't. It's only evidence you've never tried, right? And so one of the things I also, you know, look, I do a lot of weight training now. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, I grew up in the 80s and I'm a huge 80s action star, still am. I I will watch, you know, Rocky and Point Break any day of the week, although Point Break is technically a 90s movie. Um, (laughs) I'll watch those movies any day of the week. And I was always inspired by the physiques of those action stars. And I always told myself as a kid, I'll never be that. I'll never be that. And I'm not trying to do that now. What I'm trying to do is to show up in the gym. Uh, I, I love uh, weightlifting has a lot of benefits to longevity. But again, it's just the ability to go on and say, you know what? I told myself one day I could never do this. Yeah, well, let's see. Let's explore what, you, what you're actually capable of. I think the recovery is an exploration of what you're actually capable of. I think running is an exploration of what you're actually capable of. I think fitness in general is an exploration of what you're actually capable of. It does have benefits to your longevity. Of course it does. It can. It can also be negative depending on how you use it. But I use it as daily exploration. It's a way to ground me. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I found out through you, as you introduced me to, you know, a place where you can go and find delicious plant-based yeah. food is the community around there. Oh, you yeah. have some of your friends here. And it's incredible how people, you know, share that same energy. Yeah. And Talk, talk to us a little bit about those places that you frequent. And- the best community for the plant-based space in Austin is a place called ATX Food Co. It's oh, right. on Barton Springs yeah. in, uh, South, in South Lamar, um, and it's a food truck. You will find no uh, friendlier place in Austin for sure. The, the owners are these brothers named Raad and Raed. They go by Rod and Ray, but please call them by their names. They deserve it. It's okay. <laughs> we, we didn't grow up with those names, but look, if we can pronounce uh, charcuterie, we can pronounce <laughs> Raad and Raed, okay? Um, they do all oil-free, alkaline, vegan meals, and they're really great, and the, they have incredible energy there. And the place is just like this. You show up, you have no plans to meet anyone you knew, and everyone just shows up. All of a sudden, you're at a table full of people that you yeah. know and you love, and it's wonderful. Yeah. So. Start there, yeah. and you'll be surprised with how yeah. many amazing people you absolutely do. That uh, it's amazing, Adam. We ran out of time now. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. Kate is going to wrap up here. So, can I say one more thing, please? Okay. Before I go, um, I have um, a good friend who passed away a few years ago. His name is David Clark. David Clark uh, was a overweight alcoholic. Uh, he was three hundred pounds at one time, and he decided to get sober, go vegan, and become a runner. He became one of the most accomplished ultra runners in the world. He ran the um, Leadville 100. Um, he, he talked to the organizer of the Leadville 100 so that he could do it the day before and the day of. So he ran the Leadville 200, which is incredible. Um, he was one of my best friends. And he used to have a quote. He died, unfortunately. He got an infection during a surgery and he passed away. But David used to say this quote, and I think it's the best thing I've ever heard. We all know the saying. If you want to be happy, live like it's the last day of your life. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that if it was the last day of your life, you wouldn't do the things to protect your future. You wouldn't, you know, go to work. You wouldn't work out. You wouldn't, you know, eat healthy. You would likely not do the things that are important to protecting your future. What you really want to do, if you really want to be healthy, you should treat everyone else as if they were living the last day of their life. Because what would you allow people if you knew this was their last day? You wouldn't need them to be perfect to allow them into your life. You wouldn't need them to agree with you to let them into your life. You would value their presence because their presence wasn't going to be there tomorrow. Um, And so I I love that quote. I think it's incredibly valuable. And I don't do it all the time, but I try to. You do make me feel like that every time I see Ah. you. I love you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This has been amazing. Okay. What do we have next? 
So on November 17th, we have our next speaker series. And right now it's going to be a surprise, um, kind of the holiday season. So the next two weeks, we're going to announce that and we'll send invites out. Um, but just be ready on November 17th to have another one of these wonderful speaker series. Thank you so much. Thank the you. Chat so much. Is just Thank you. Thank you.